Hello, we'd like to welcome you back for Module 2 of Design Standards Index 400 Guardrail Training. In Module 2, we'll be taking a look at Sheets 11 through 22. Here on Sheet 11, we cover the end treatment for our controlled release terminal system, uh, also known as the CRT. So essentially, this is for use uh, with short radius guardrail systems that are shown on the next sheet. It's really the same as the previous standard, we've just detailed it a little more clearly here. So it's a little bit easier to follow. Something to make note of is the begin end guardrail station is called out at post 1. Uh, that would correspond to where you place your beginner end guardrail station in the plans. Additionally, we show at uh, the center line of this splice where the CRT system, where the rest of the CRT guardrail system would begin as it's detailed out on the next sheet. Okay, so here is the next sheet and it's showing the different types of radiuses for a guardrail. You would basically select one of these. These are used for 90 degree intersections of the principal roadway and the side street or driveway. So here you can see we have a principal roadway labeled up here and then this would be the side street. Clearly this can be reversed. Right here is our CRT end treatment that we've just spoken about on the previous sheet. And you can see it essentially connects to the primary system where that match line is. And what you would do in the plans is essentially draw this entire system the way it's detailed here in the standard. You would emulate that uh, and draw it to scale and make sure you included all the components. It's very important to include all the components that are shown here. And we'll explain that in a moment. And again, when terminating this with a CRT end treatment right here, you essentially align it with the match line. Uh, the other option at the match line is then to go and connect into existing guardrail. And so we have both options shown here in the connecting detail. Uh, so to zoom in a little bit on one of the systems, we've just chose the 24-foot radius system as an example. And you can see we have the begin end CRT uh, station called out. This would look similar to what it would be in your plans. You call out a begin or end depending on the, the direction the stationing was going. Uh, you also call out the actual radius of the system uh, to let the contractor know which one they're building. And then you would want to draw this whole thing to scale. And again, the begin end guardrail station is called out here at post 1. That's shown in the elevation view that we showed you back on sheet 11. And then we have our minimum clear area limits. Uh, those are clearly detailed here. Now, I wanted to get into a little bit of a discussion on why it's important to draw this in your plans exactly the way we have it shown here. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen some cases where, you know, a designer, they were just doing their best to try to make uh, any type of guardrail fit into their system. They might have had a canal that was right here, kind of within the clear area limits. And, but the right-of-way line uh, was very close to it or right behind it. And so they were trying to do anything they possibly could to shield the canal. And so we had seen an installation where, you know, maybe only half of the standard was drawn. And then they terminated it with the Type 2. So they're interchanging guardrail parts. Unfortunately, you simply cannot do that. That's not going to work. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the training, guardrail in general is not designed for 90-degree impacts. It's really designed for that shallow angle impact of about 25 degrees. We need to keep guardrail parallel to the roadway. This system right here is one of the few cases where it is designed to handle a 90 degree impact. You have a vehicle coming from left to right, hit that thing at 90 degrees. The only way it can function properly and the only way it can capture that vehicle is through a lot of energy absorption. And it handles that by having all of these posts be special CRT breakaway posts. So you can clearly see the difference. Uh, this would be our standard post and offset block. Here you go to simply having a CRT post. And so it goes all the way around. When the vehicle hits that, it generally takes up almost the entire clear area limit in order to capture that vehicle and absorb all that energy. So if you had a, a hazard back here, a rigid hazard or a canal, chances are the vehicle is going to end up right in that canal. You know, even worse, if you don't use the entire system, say it was terminated halfway, it's just simply not going to absorb that energy. The vehicle will just punch right through and there'll be no chance of capturing that vehicle whatsoever. And so you have to use the entire system. You have to keep this entire area back here, the minimum clear area limits, uh, free of any type of hazards. So in general, you know, you have your 1 to 10 approach slope, which is required for all guardrail. That 1 to 10 approach slope has to be maintained to, I guess, two feet behind the posts. Um, so that's pretty much the standard. After that, you're allowed to go to a bit of a steeper slope, and it still will capture the vehicle, but you can't really have any above ground uh, raised hazards. You can't have any type of canal hazards or anything like that. You have to keep it free and clear. So then the question comes up, well, if we can't fit the entire CRT system, well, how do we handle something if we happen to have a canal hazard and we have very limited right away? What I would offer as a suggestion is to use a standard approach terminal 
You carry this guardrail here parallel to the roadway for as long as possible. Maybe use a flare terminal to kind of wrap the hazard as far as you possibly can. And then we have something called a non-gating approach terminal. And essentially what that does is it, it provides some redirective capability right at post one all the way at the end. And so you have the greatest chance of uh, redirecting that vehicle. You can continue that, that end treatment as far as possible, flare it, and use non-gating so you get redirective at post one. And that would be, that would be our recommendation, uh, probably the best way to handle that. All right, so now moving on to sheet 13, we have our approach transition connections to rigid barrier. This happens to be the general TL3 version. Uh, we now have a, a TL2 version, which we'll show you in a moment. And this is an all new approach transition. This one is now MASH tested. It applies to all design speeds because it's TL3. Uh, it's about 12 foot six inches shorter uh, than the old DTLJ. So I think people who are familiar with guardrail have referenced DTLJ quite often anytime they're connecting to a rigid barrier. Uh, this is essentially what is replacing that old detail J, is this detail right here. It'll save you, again, about 12 and a half feet when you're measuring from the end of the rigid barrier. So the overall system is a little bit shorter to save you some space. You might be able to fit it into a, a tighter area. The overall system is about 25 feet shorter than the old detail J. Uh, if you consider that we've removed uh, that large barrier overlap right here, we now have a more simple connection where it's basically just overlaps uh, the length of that thrive beam terminal connector and that's really it uh, these are the basically the latest way that these uh these transitions are crash tested is with this simple connection as shown and so we're emulating that this also has a new raised alignment curb and essentially we're having a, a vertical face curb come along here and then it lines up right with the end of this barrier uh, the idea behind that is it prevents wheel snagging uh, we'll discuss that a little further in a moment the section views for this are located on sheet 15, so you see we have all these sections defined. Um, and two sheets later, we'll show you all those sections that help define all this curb and how all this guardrail is offset. So here we have some, some pictures, uh, multiple angles. Uh, we pulled these from several crash test reports. It seemed like in all the crash test reports we've seen, uh, they can never manage to take a picture of the entire system, so we just grab multiple photos for you so you can get a feel uh, for it. It looks like here. Um, they have some type of alignment curve. That's not exactly what ours would be, but ours would look very similar to that. And here you can see the terminal overlap doesn't go the full, you know, 12 foot 6 inches past that as the old detail J would. Uh, it just connects right here with the thrive beam terminal connector, and that's it. So looking at the elevation view, the first thing we would call out is the begin and guardrail station. Just draw your attention to that. That would correspond to the way you called it out in the plans. And we're also showing the begin and rigid barrier station so you can clearly see that that's different. Now the thing to take note of is that seven and a quarter inch overlap. So in the past we were used to detail J where there was an even larger overlap than that. It was uh, I think 12 foot six inches further than seven and a quarter inches. The overlap has gotten much smaller but it's still there. So for stationing purposes uh, when you're calling out the beginning of your guardrail still does overlap the concrete barrier a little bit so you have to pay attention to that and account for that in the stationing and then here would be where our end transition of curb is so at this point you'd have a type f curb uh, you might have shoulder gutter uh, or you may have no curb at all and um, when we show you those cross sections uh, for sheet 15 we'll we'll show you how that all gets handled uh, there's multiple options on sheet 15. okay so here we're showing a plan view of our pro transition connection uh, the first thing we've drawn your attention to is the rigid barrier shoulder line. Um, this, if you happen to be transitioning to a shoulder gutter by section EE, that rigid barrier shoulder line would project out straight, basically parallel to the roadway, and it would align with that rigid barrier shoulder line as it's shown on index 300. Uh, we'll show you an example of that on an upcoming slide. We then uh, are going to draw your attention to tapering the guardrail to the offset per the plans. and so. This is one of the, the major concepts of this training, is the fact that we are sort of empowering designers now. By using a couple different types of station and offsets, you can really define the guardrail and where it goes. And so one of the, one of the call outs would be begin and end of guardrail. The other type of call out is basically the begin and end of taper station. And so here we're showing at section EE, this is where the designer would begin their taper. It's just linear. We define that in the standard that the taper would be linear. But by defining station and offsets of each taper point, you can define the taper rate and everything else. And then the contractor just builds it per the stations that are shown. 
And so at section EE is where you would begin tapering to whatever type of typical section is required of the guardrail. And that those offsets are typically shown in PPM of figure 4.4.12. Uh, I'll show you some, some cuts from uh, the PPM figure 4.4.12 coming up. And then finally, we have the end transition of curb. That's also occurring at section EE. So by the time you get here, either your type F would be established, your shoulder gutter would be established, or you'd have no curb at all. And so there's multiple options for that. And again, we'll show you that on sheet 15. Okay, so we're going to push this point a little bit further here. So here is where you'd begin your taper. And again, I mentioned uh, PPM 4.4.12. These are the sections that you're going to be following, uh, whether you have you know, your flush shoulder condition, or whether you have the raised curb, or whether you know your your guardrail, you have a raised curb, but your guardrail is considered further behind the curb. Um, you're allowed to do that between four and 12 feet. You can place the guardrail for design speeds less than or equal to 45 miles per hour. So you have all these different options uh, per the PPM. It describes it pretty well. It's all in chapter four. And whatever type of typical section you chose as a designer, section EE is where you'd begin tapering to that typical section. Uh, to kind of drive the point home a little further, we're giving you a sneak peek now of sheet 17. And you can see this point right here, this big green arrow, that's section EE. And so you'd call out your begin taper, your end taper. The contractor knows it's always going to be linear. And so by the time you got to this green circle, that would be your typical section. So this whole portion right here would be your typical section per the PPM. And it looked like one of these guys down here. So we're trying to leave all the options open call out a couple taper stations and it takes care of that for the contractor. All right, moving on to sheet 14. This is something that is really completely new. Now we have a TL2 alternative for a pro transition connection to rigid barrier. Uh, this one's been mash tested as well. This one applies to design speeds less than or equal to 45 miles per hour as do most other things that are TL2. It's just a shorter, kind of less robust system, but the idea is to get some cost savings. If you happen to have a road where you know the design speed will never be over 45 miles per hour, um, you can consider installing this system instead, save you some space and save you some money. It has a new raised alignment curb. It's the same basic alignment curb configuration as the TL3, it's just shorter. And again, the section views are on sheet 15. So we've set up the standard so that whether you're using the TL3 or the TL2, all of these cross sections are identical. Um, the only difference is the spacing between them is a little different for TL2. Everything gets a little shorter, but it's all the same as the TL3 version and, and all the cross sections are on sheet 15 to define what's going on. So here we have some pictures. Basically, you can just see it's a lot smaller, a lot more, more robust. Uh, we can almost call it adorable compared to its bigger brother there. But yeah, it's just a small little approach transition for TL2. And again, it's a similar transition to the TL3 version. So you can see we have our begin and guardrail station called out in the same way. You still have your begin and rigid barrier station. It still has that seven and a quarter inch difference between the end of the barrier and where we consider the guardrail to start. By the way, the reason for this difference is that guardrail panels are measured from the bolt slot to bolt slot. And we want to include entire panel lengths for guardrail. And when you install this terminal connector, it just so happens to be that these bolt slots end up in this position. So you do have a little bit of a seven and a quarter offset. And it's important to maintain this, especially when we go to double faced, we're actually going to insert some offset blocks and it all has to be compatible. So, so we'll explain that in future slides, but um, we're measuring in full panel lengths. And that's the reason the begin guardrail uh, is, is slightly different uh, from the begin end of the rigid barrier station. And then once again, we have the end transition of the curb and that's basically the same as the TL3. So by the time you get here, what's known as your alignment curb and that specific shape uh, that kind of matches up with this barrier, it starts to transform and it can either be shoulder gutter type F or either the curb can just stop altogether for a flush shoulder. And again, so we have the rigid barrier shoulder line. This is the same as the TL3, you project that out. Uh, one other thing to mention is with all these approach transitions, um, something else uh, we've added uh, for the next release of this standard, uh, just a note to explain that this whole section is parallel to the roadway, and it's the same for the TL3 as well. So these sections are parallel to the roadway, that's the way they're crash tested, and then that's the reason why the taper begins here to get to your typical section, because that is parallel to the road. Here you begin tapering to your typical section, same as TL3, uh, look at PPM figure 4.4.12. And then here will be your end transition of your curb. 
Moving along to sheet 15, it shows the cross-section details for all the approach transitions we've just seen in the previous few sheets. It provides you your curb options for your shoulder gutter, your raised curb, or your flat no curb option. We have some nice isometric views just trying to give you the bigger picture of what's happening. They correspond to these sections as well, so we've called out the sections um, just so you get a feel for the way that, that curb is going to look. So the idea behind the alignment curve is it aligns with the face of the rigid barrier. It's going to prevent the wheel snagging or at least reduces the potential for it. Uh, that's the idea. Um, this is recommended by TTI. Essentially, you know, when a vehicle impacts guardrail, it's sliding along. You know, we do attempt to make the guardrail more rigid. That's the idea behind the tighter post spacing. But it may never be quite as rigid as this rigid barrier here. And so the idea is by putting a curb that's also very rigid aligned with the face of that, that that will catch the vehicle's wheels and, and tires and essentially keep it flush with the barrier so the vehicle's tires don't get caught and snag on the barrier. If the vehicle's tires get snag on the barrier, the vehicle can rotate and, and become very unstable. And so we try to uh, prevent snagging in any way we can. And so that's the purpose of this whole alignment curb. Now what happens is this alignment curb, okay, you can see it, it matches the exact shape of the front of that barrier. The barrier had an F shape and then it was cut back uh, for this particular scenario. Uh, it aligns with that, with that flat portion where the barrier begins. Then if you're coming out of the page, away from the barrier, you start to move through all these sections. And what's happening is this is essentially going parallel to the roadway. It's staying in a nice straight line because that whole approach transition is parallel to the roadway. Okay, so this section right here, section DD, we're just going to repeat from the previous page. What's happening is you go from BB, this is basically where it mates to the rigid barrier, coming out of the page away from the rigid barrier. Uh, we now show an intermediate section. You happen to have a thry beam as part of that transition section of the guardrail. So that's just what it looks like at the intermediate phase. Then when you get to the end of this alignment curve, right here, this is the end of this shape and you can see above it now we've now transitioned to W beam. So it's the end of the alignment curve, however it's the beginning of the transition and now we're going to transition to whatever type of curve the designer chooses. So we'll move along to this sheet now. So we're going to repeat this guy. So we've ended our alignment curve but we're beginning our transition and we're ending our transition. And so here you can see we got our begin transition, end transition, this is the first option, a uh, shoulder gutter. So you can clearly see an isometric view. The alignment curve is transitioning from its shape that's required to prevent wheel snagging down to a shoulder gutter. And what happens is, I think the contractor would pretty much, you know, form up that shape of curb. Then they they form up shoulder gutter. They'd create that shape, and then they basically just pour the difference. And so that's how that works. They just know the distance between the two and then they just kind of smooth out the difference, pour the difference. So one thing I'll mention is this shoulder line. I'll go ahead and bring up the future points here so you can see what, what we're, we're talking about and get a feel for it. So you can see in this detail from index 300, uh, the shoulder line is called out and where it, it is positioned within the shoulder gutter. This shoulder line essentially projects out from the rigid barrier shoulder line, uh, the original toe of that barrier would be considered the edge of the shoulder and then it just projects out and runs parallel to the roadway and then that's where your shoulder gutter is aligned at section EE. And so that, that's how that works. Now we'll go a little further here. So again we're coming out of the page away from the rigid barrier. We transition from you know our typical alignment curb shape to the shoulder gutter shape. Now continuing even further this happens to be section EE. This is where you begin your taper of your guardrail. And so continuing even further out of the page, you're typically headed towards that type of typical section. And so you can see what the difference is where the face of guardrail is located. This happens to come right from our guardrail uh, typical section sheet. Uh, it matches the requirements of the PPM in general. Face of guardrail is six inches behind the back of the gutter. And so you're going to want to transition the face of your guardrail from this point at section EE to that point. And it's generally shoulder line plus two feet. And the other thing you can look at, okay, if you got your shoulder line right here, okay, it's called out in the index. You got six inches plus one foot, gets you to the back of the shoulder line. You add another six inches to that, that's two feet. So it's shoulder line plus two feet. And so generally your goal 
in a lot of cases, not all, but in a lot of cases for your typical section is to get the guardrail to shoulder line plus two feet. And so you taper from section EE as long as you need to taper to get there. And we have uh, specific taper rates that we'll cover in the IDS portion of the training. Okay, so moving along to the raised curb option, you can see we have it shown in the isometric view. Now you're transitioning from your alignment curb portion to what the raised curb would look like. The shapes are more similar, as you can see. And what happens is, in this case, once you get to section EE, continuing even further on uh, outside of the page and away from the rigid barrier, the ultimate goal here is to look like this final guardrail typical section. So you're already pretty close. Um, if you happen to be keeping it the guardrail flush with the face of curb, um, I believe you're already there or you're close to it, or you might be going to five inches behind the face of curb. Uh, so you still would require a little taper. It would just be a lot smaller uh, than something like a shoulder gutter or a flush shoulder. Again, taper rate guidance is provided in the IDS. So now our last option is the flush no curb option. And so, you know, you're starting off with your alignment curb. Then essentially, as you can see in the isometric view, that alignment curb just starts dropping down and it flattens out and then you have an end face and essentially soil just kind of mates up to the end of that and continues on as a flush shoulder. That could also be shoulder pavement as well. So normally the section you'd be headed to after section EE, this is, would be your starting point of your taper. And then the end point would look like this. So we were saying before, whatever your shoulder width happens to be, this would go to your shoulder line plus two feet. Your face of guardrail usually ends up at shoulder line plus two feet for a flush shoulder condition. Sheet 16 shows another approach transition connection to rigid barrier, only this time it's for double-faced guardrail. So this is an all new type of connection now. It applies to all design speeds, and essentially this is a hybrid of the previous double-faced connection and then the new MASH-tested TL3. So everything you see here from this point over, from the rigid barrier face over, this post spacing is similar, if not exact, to that TL3 single-faced version, only now we have a double-faced system. But then we've gone ahead and added in this overlap. And so that 12 foot 6 inch addition of overlap, the reason for that is to transition the overall guardrail system width back down to the width of this double-faced uh, rigid barrier here. I think that's just considered a full barrier. It's got faces on both sides. But in any case, it is not nearly as wide as that guardrail system, but you need to have a smooth transition to it. So you add in these offset blocks. Uh, each one gets progressively a little bit smaller. The trimmed offset blocks, as they're all detailed, uh, they're a little different depending on whether that's steel post or timber post because the system width would change just a little bit. Um, but for the most part, that's the theory behind the offset blocks is to slow transition uh, the gradual change to the width of this concrete barrier and then you'd mount with the bolts right here. So similar to the single faced, we show our begin end. In this case, it's double faced guardrail. That's where the call out is that would correspond to your plan view. In this case, it's at a little bit different location as you can see. The single faced, as we pointed out, was that short little connection with only the thrive beam terminal connector. This system shifts it 12 foot 6 inches for a total of 13 foot 1 and a quarter inches. And that's the total overlap. So when you call out the beginning of your guardrail, because you have to include all the panels, you have to overlap with the rigid barrier by 13 foot 1 and a quarter inches. And then this portion right here, LA, is essentially, as I'd pointed out, the same, especially in the elevation view, it's the same as the TL3 single-faced guardrail with all of the post spacing being the same. One thing that is different is that the curb is omitted. The reason we've done that is because, well, first, uh, the post would actually conflict with the curb in certain ways. And then secondly, this right here, these offset blocks hold the face of the guardrail a little bit further away from the toe of that cutback curb. And what ends up happening is you have a lot more clearance between the face of that guardrail and this concrete barrier, uh, just the way this is connected. Because you have this extra clearance here, the curb is really not required. Uh, the snagging hazard is really reduced uh, because the, the, the concrete barrier is so much further back behind that steel panel, the face of the steel panel. Okay, so again, this would be the rigid barrier, typically from index 410. Here are your trimmed standard offset blocks that we had shown you, and this is the reason for this overlap, is to uh, reduce the overall system width. 
Now, if you were going to taper this, generally this might be running right down the median. You wouldn't require any kind of tapers for your typical section. But if you did want to transition this, this would be the equivalent to the section EE. And then after this point, basically one post inside of this approach transition connection, um, you can start tapering to whatever offset that you wanted to. Okay, so we've reached the end of the third quarter and we're going to go through some of these review questions. I'll read you the question and then give you a few seconds to see if you can come up with the answer and then I'll go ahead and give you the answer. So question number one, when is a CRT configuration used? So that's basically our short radius guardrail system. Uh, it's used for 90 degree intersections of the principal roadways uh, and side streets or driveways. And it doesn't have to be exactly 90 degrees. we would spoken about this in uh, several of our other trainings. You can taper you know, to that 90 degree uh, radius that's shown at the taper rates that we provide in the IDS. I'll try to give you a little more flexibility with that. Okay, question number two. For approach transition connections, when is the guardrail panel overlap with the rigid barrier of about 12 foot 6 inches required? That's for the double faced guardrail connections. So we try to be a little tricky, ask the questions out of order. Um, but yeah, for a double faced guardrail, uh, you require uh, that extra overlap to transition uh, the width of the guardrail system to the width of the rigid barrier system. For single faced approach transition connections, what is the location difference between the begin guardrail station and the face of the rigid barrier in inches? So now we're going back to talking about the single faced. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference between the edge of the rigid barrier and then where we consider guardrail to begin. That's seven and a quarter inches. So you have to keep track of that in your stationing. All single faced approach transition connections require an alignment curve underneath. True or false? Again, we're talking single faced. So the answer is true. Um, the idea behind that is you're trying to prevent wheel snagging. Basically that thry beam panel is very close to the toe of the barrier. And so you're trying to prevent the wheel from snagging on the toe of that rigid barrier. So you go ahead and put an alignment curve there. Question five, all double faced approach transition connections require an alignment curve underneath. True or false? Now we're talking double faced. And the answer is false. Um, like we had said, because you have those, those offset blocks to transition the system widths, the face of the guardrail panel is a little bit further away from the toe of the barrier. So that helps to prevent snagging by itself and then you don't need an alignment curb. Uh, you'd also have some issues fitting an alignment curb under there anyway. Uh, question number six, for single faced approach transition connections, at what section on the index sheet do you begin the guardrail taper? You're usually headed towards, you know, two feet from the shoulder line to get to your typical section. Uh, but there's one cross section we talked about where you'd begin your taper. The answer is section EE. Okay, so going into the fourth quarter of our design standard index sheet training, we're going to move on to sheet 17, which shows here some layouts to rigid barrier. Essentially, we're showing examples for the contractor of how all these uh, various segments that we've discussed would fit together. And so, really, in previous slides, we had been talking about what amounts to segments. And so, if you recall, we talked about our approach transitions, rigid barriers over here on the left. Uh, we're connecting to it with our approach transition. Previous sheets, we had assigned the length of that, the letter LA. Then if you look over on the right side here, we then would have our approach terminal, segment LE. And so you can see these are various segments. Uh, right here through the middle would be like your typical section in the PPM. Here's how you taper to get to it. So we'll, we'll walk you through these, these various layouts. This also provides uh, information to the contractor of how your plan's callouts would correspond to what's shown here. In, in these example layouts so they can see how it all fits together. Okay, so we're going to zoom in on the plan view for the single-faced barrier, uh, basically your single-faced approach to rigid barrier. The first thing that we'll discuss here would be where your typical section would be located if you happen to have a real lengthy run of guardrail. Uh, you may have connected to a bridge or a concrete barrier. 
and you're going to continue this run of guardrail for a very long distance and you know you want to be shielding some hazards on the side of the road this is where it would go right here now you could have a case where you're trying to design and this actually happens quite frequently the shortest possible run of guardrail simply to protect the parapet here and in that case you may just want to have the minimum length of approach transition LA per the standard plus LE and that would be your shortest guardrail system for the most part um, there are different methods you can also try to have a shorter approach terminal length per the APL drawings and, and we'll talk about that later in the IDS um, but for now we'll just say okay the shortest length of guardrail would be LA plus LE now if you're going for the short a nice short run of guardrail simply trying to protect that rigid barrier and that's it um, all you would have to do is add LA plus LE you don't have to have this taper anymore if your overall guardrail system length is less than 150 feet you can just connect these two systems together you don't have to worry about your typical section offset you just run parallel to that shoulder line and then you can put your your flare on there if you want to um, if you choose to use a flared end terminal but you would not have this little offset here uh, just connect this this segment to that segment and so your begin end guardrail stations are called out these would be how they correspond in the in, in your plans um, and your begin end taper stations are also called out from here to here and that would be if you're trying to go to some longer run of guardrail that happened to be at your typical section per the ppm and again this starts at section ee right here so then to uh, again drive this home a little further by the time you get to the end of this taper you're going to be looking like one of your typical sections per the ppm all right so now we're going to show you a layout configuration that we call median crossover guardrail this is one of our important tools in the toolbox uh, it's one configuration to use that's going to handle the situation where generally you might have sister bridges with a narrow median so Considering this traffic up here uh, coming from right to left, this rigid barrier for the opposing lane could be in the clear zone for this traffic. If it happens to be the case, you would then have to shield that barrier. And so you're going to have to extend some guardrail. You have your paneling. Now because you need guardrail here, this traffic coming from left to right might have a hazard of the back of that guardrail. So the back of those posts could be a hazard if it wasn't made to be double-faced guardrail. And so you go ahead and continue your panels. You're going to add panels onto the back side. So now you have double face guardrail to shield the traffic that's going from left to right, since there happens to be guardrail there anyway. Uh, and it's a narrow median. Now, some things to pay attention to in the overall layout. Once again, we have our begin end guardrail stations. If you note, this says begin double faced guardrail. Despite the fact that this approach transition does not have double faced guardrail for the entire approach transition, for the purposes of quantities, we're going to go ahead and consider this all to be double-faced guardrail, just to make things uh, more simple. You know, really in the in the big scheme of things, uh, in the price per linear foot, that's going to make a very small difference. And when we keep track of those prices, and so the idea is just to keep things simple and not have to have anybody worried about how far exactly that panel extends. Um, we're just going to go ahead and make the entire thing double-faced guardrail as far as quantities go. You see we've called out our begin and taper stations. Now these become a little bit more complex to calculate. Now there's a lot that goes into it. The length of need calculations we're going to discuss in the IDS portion and then the length of the need program. We're going to understand a little bit more about how this calculation takes place. But for right now you just need to know that well that guardrail length of need program is going to assist you with knowing these station and offsets. So essentially you have four station and offsets Two of them are just begin or end of guardrail, and two of them are begin or end of taper. That will define this entire segment for the contractor, and that's really all you need to know. When we show you our length of need program, you'll see how to come up with those four stations and offsets. Length of need program will basically provide that for you. Okay, some other things to look at on this layout. Um, when you draw this in your plans, you're going to want to draw it to scale to the station and offsets that the length of need program provides. You also want to show that this is double-faced guardrail, so graphically in your plans you show it as double-faced guardrail. You can figure out just by looking at your plan view, if you come off of the opposing lane's rigid barrier at 30 degrees, uh, you could figure out how far that double-faced guardrail should extend, and you just want to show it for graphical purposes. The standard will also back up the plans and explain where that back face of guardrail is supposed to terminate. For the most part, you don't want contractors confusing this and thinking that's single-faced guardrail because that's how you showed it in your plan. So just go ahead and show it as double-faced. And then one other thing, 
we've defined this now a little bit better than previously. Uh, the previous standard had shown what we now call the slope guard in between bridges, basically protecting that bridge abutment slope break. And when I say protecting, I really mean it's just delineating it, putting a structure in the way um, such that maintenance vehicles uh, coming along will have a nice uh, visible barrier or whoever happens to be uh, moving along the median. We want to note that you know, this is not considered crashworthy. Um, it's not anchored properly for a high-speed vehicle impact. Uh, the angle is not correct relative to the road. Uh, the only thing it's really doing, like I said, it's just providing a little bit of an obstruction and a visual barrier to this drop-off. And so we've called it a slope guard. When we get to the IDS portion, I'll explain a little bit more about how to, how to quantify it and exactly how to draw it. Basically, you're going to draw this in your plans as it's shown in the standard. It terminates uh, one foot from each concrete parapet on either side here. So it's basically one foot from the rigid barrier on either side and then the contractor will have uh, various methods of bringing this slope guard within one foot of that rigid barrier. Uh, there's certain ways to do that and again we'll discuss more in the IDS. So moving on to sheet 18 uh, we're now going to talk about just the typical double face attachment to rigid barrier and then we also have uh, some trailing end connections and we'll, we'll show you how that works. So on this double-faced approach, again, it's really the same type of methodology as the single face. The shortest possible length of guardrail, if all you were looking to do uh, was to shield this double-faced concrete barrier, is that you would take your LA and add your LE to it for the end treatment, or you would add your standard length for the crash cushion per standard index 430. Uh, the two of these together would be your shortest possible length, and that's what that note is explaining. Typically, when you're hooking up guardrail, you're going to want to extend that for some length. Uh, you may be trying to prevent uh, crossover accidents and things like that. And so this would normally extend and you'd have a large typical section. If you wanted this offset to be slightly different, you would basically define these tapers for the contractor as they're shown. So again, we'll review some of those callouts. So you'd have your begin end of guardrail. In this case, it's all double face. And then here are your begin end tapers. And then, you know, typically you'd, you'd want your guardrail to be at the shoulder line plus two feet. And that would be a typical section right here if you're going to move it at all. If this was centered between roadways, you may not have to taper that at all, but we're, we're explaining where the taper callouts would go to give the designer some flexibility there. So moving along to the trailing end, we have some different segments here. We have this trailing connection LC, which we define right on the same sheet. And then we have our trailing anchorage. That would typically be the type two that we've already seen it was defined in an earlier sheet. So we're showing the begin end guardrail callouts. These would be placed in the plans to correspond to the standard. And then again, your begin end taper. So if you were going to run this guardrail along for a nice long length, shield some hazards, you'd want to use your PPM offset and you can taper from here to here. And then here we're showing something that is all new to index 400 and that would be the way to connect on the trailing end. You're connecting your W beam and you're going to use a thrive beam transition panel to go to that thrive beam terminal connector. This thrive beam terminal connector, only that particular portion, connects essentially the same way that the approach terminals do. And then to transition that rigidity a little bit better than, than it had been handled in previous standards, you're going to put a thriving terminal connector there with one extra post slightly closer to the concrete barrier. And so you have a little bit more of a rigidity transition. This is also helpful if you're putting this to an existing bridge railing where you might have some of those little pedestals that come out that were meant for mounting the W beam directly to the concrete barrier. Some of those happen to be at 27 inch height because our new guardrail is at 31 inch height, uh, having a thriving terminal connector provides you a lot more play. You can almost mount this over the entire platform or pedestal and it just covers the whole thing. And so that's, that might be helpful in that regard. Moving on to sheet number 19, we're gonna look at some rub rail details. Just pretty briefly, it's the, the same rub rail that we've always had in our standard. We just, had never shown it really detailed and assembled and to be honest throughout the entire country uh, there are very few details on how to assemble rub rail. Previously the standard had just referenced uh, the guide to standardized barrier hardware 
that guy to standardize barrier hardware just showed the pieces. It didn't really show how they fit together and uh, how they were attached to the posts. And so we just went ahead and detailed that out to make it clear for contractors. The contractors are going to have two different options here. They could have the channel section rub rail or the bent plate rub rail. So when you call that out, begin and rub rail in your plans, they could use either one of those two options. We have uh, some more specific detail about where to begin and end rub rail. For the most part, you need to end it uh, outside of approach treatments or approach terminals. And I think that's the only restriction we have. So we just show it how it would end. Uh, you tie it back. We essentially don't want that rub rail to interfere with the performance of that approach terminal. Usually these are designed in a proprietary way with specific hardware in here, and we don't want the rub rail to be interfering with that. And so we're just keeping that outside of the approach terminal segment. So what you would do for rub rail is label the begin end of rub rail stations. We'll explain that a little further in the IDS, and we'll also show you how to quantify it and, uh, and put it in your summary box. And as I was saying, you terminate the rubber outside of the end treatment segments. So the approach terminal LE and the trailing anchorage LT. You go ahead and terminate it at the post prior to, the, to that segment. And then just to review from sheet six, we're only going to use rub rail for median slopes that are greater than one to 10. So you can only really use it on the median side. And then if the slope happens to be greater than that one to 10, the maximum allowable is actually one to six. So if you're between one to 10 and one to six, you're going to go ahead and uh, use that rub rail. Uh, just to help to increase the capture rate of the vehicles coming from that direction. Sheet number 20 shows some details for our pipe rail pedestrian safety treatment. As you can see, we've added a few more details uh, to better explain some things. Previously, uh, we did not address how the pipe rail would be spliced together over a certain length. And obviously, you know, the pipe rail lengths would tend to be longer than what can fit on a truck. So we would end up seeing some, some attempts at splices out there in the field. Uh, unfortunately, we may see some jagged welding. In some cases, the pipe rail was just floating in the air and not even connected at all. So we went ahead and created a rail splice detail. Uh, we're essentially putting a smaller pipe inside there and some through bolts. So that now that's defined for the contractor. But if you recall, you know, pipe rail is essentially designed right here to shield these flanges and particularly the sharp edges of these flanges. So it's, it's kind of nice to see it in an isometric view so you can understand what's going on. The idea is to keep uh, pedestrians from getting snagged on these things or possibly uh, cut or injured from those points. Uh, just to review again, the criteria is that pipe rail is required where steel posts will be located within four feet of sidewalks or shared use paths. And from a design point of view, you should generally assume that the steel posts are going to be used. So the idea is if you're within four feet of a sidewalk or shared use path, if you use timber posts, then you don't require pipe rail. But in general, it's preferred for the designer to leave the, leave the contractor the option of using steel posts or timber posts. Contractors tend to prefer steel posts. They're easier to drive. I think their process goes a lot quicker, and that's why they prefer steel. So in your plans, as far as quantities go, you should always assume that pipe rail is used, and you want to call it out in the plan view as begin or end of pipe rail. And that station would actually end on a timber post. Now the pipe rail must terminate outside of the end treatment segments, uh, also the approach transition segments. So what happens is it ends on a timber post. If it happens to be an approach transition, that whole approach transition would have to be timber posts if it was within four feet of a sidewalk or shared use path. And essentially that's how it gets handled. So the entire run would be steel posts. And then if you were coming up to a bridge that had a sidewalk and the back of your posts were within four feet of that sidewalk, that whole approach transition would be timber, and that's how that would be handled. As I mentioned earlier, you begin in pipe rail station. Okay, so sheet number 21, called this new and improved uh, mostly. We've added some additional clarification over how to handle some of these things. We've also added a whole new option for mounting through concrete. So the modified mounts uh, will assist the contractor for post atop concrete structures, uh, for post over shallow underground utilities, or for posts to top the concrete surface. So we have these three options here. All right, we're gonna focus in on how we would handle coming across a concrete structure uh, in the ground. In this case, we're showing a curb inlet as an example. And there's a few different uh, items to think about. So your post spacing would be just coming along every six foot three for the most part. And now if one of your posts happened to fall 
on top of one of these structures. Unfortunately, you couldn't just you know, use your standard post. You couldn't mount into soil. You'd have a concrete structure in the way. And so how, how would you handle that? Well, the first thing is if your post falls entirely upon that structure, and it basically has the base plate that's beyond three inches from the edge of the structure, as we have detailed here, then you'd use the special steel post with the base plate mount, and that's pretty much all there is to it. You keep the spacing the same, and that would be finished. Now, alternatively, and unfortunately, what might happen in some cases is that the post could fall right on top of this edge portion, and we went ahead and labeled that an edge conflict. And so when that happens, you have to have a few options uh, in order to get out of that situation. So we've developed these two different options. For option one, we consider that just basically the standard post option, possibly additional offset blocks, but we allow movement of these posts plus or minus a quarter span. And so you essentially move a quarter span in the direction away from the structure. If you wanted to add additional offset blocks, you could. You could add up to two for three blocks total and then you could just mount the post in the soil. And that would actually be the preferred option because then you don't have to have any, uh, any uh, steel posts on hand with the special base plate. In addition to that, um, the rotation of the posts is preferred upon impact. It would perform a little bit more the way it was crash tested. And so that would likely be the easiest uh, for the contractor to handle. But we do offer another option, and that would be option two here. And so essentially, okay, you're going to move towards the structure by up to a quarter span. And then you're, that would enable this entire steel base plate to fit on top of the structure so it could be mounted correctly three inches from the edge of the structure. Okay, we're going to move on to the option of an encased post for a shallow mount. In general, this would be used to almost span the guardrail over underground utilities. And so this option here can save you 20 inches of depth uh, versus the standard posts. The contractor has the option to use it as needed, or it can get billed beyond the plans quantity. I know each district handles that a little bit differently if something wasn't included as part of the plans quantities. I know each district has a method for the contractor to then bill them above and beyond what was considered in the plans. In general, you'd want to, to avoid that and kind of tip the contractor off to all the possibilities of them needing some special posts. And so as a designer, if you foresee that your guardrail is going to be running across an in-ground structure, it's going to be running over an underground utility, and it's going to need one of these posts, it's going to be running through concrete sidewalk, uh, you can go ahead and include that in your, in your plans quantities. And then the contractor will just be aware that they need these things. We don't expect designers to know exactly where their post will fall over a long run of guardrail. Um, some vertical curvature can come into play. And it, you know, it's hard to keep track of exactly where the posts fall. But for the most part, the designer should know if the guardrail is running through some of these areas that would require a special post. And you can go ahead and tabulate up some of these special posts so the contractor knows about it ahead of time, has it on hand. It could save everybody some time. So that's the idea. But we'll get, we'll get back to just talking about the special post here for the, the encased option. This encased post, and we had specified it may only be used for non-consecutive posts now, uh, visiting every district, uh, we automatically get a little pushback and everyone says, yeah, we, we typically would need that for you know at least two or three posts uh, to get over whatever underground utility we would have. And typically that would be okay. This particular setup wasn't crash tested. It had been designed to essentially provide the same overturn resistance as the deeper standard post. And so you just get a little width added to it. It's supposed to rotate upon impact. Uh, however, because it wasn't crash tested, uh, we do prefer the majority of the guardrail system to just be standard the way it was crash tested. Uh, we, we want these to only be used where absolutely necessary, where there's no other options. And we certainly do not want an entire run of guardrail to have these encased posts. So we want them used sparingly. I'd say up to three posts uh, consecutively would probably be reasonable. But that is an engineering decision. And again, if the designer happens to know of a definite post-utility conflict, uh, may be called out and quantified in the plans, and that would be uh, that would be preferred, so that the contractor has some heads up. All right, moving into the last type of special post, this is called the frangible leave-out for the concrete surface mount. We had discussed this earlier on uh, in terms of what your options are for when you're you absolutely have to be mounting posts uh, through concrete. In most cases, it would be sidewalk, and what this involves is blocking out the concrete around the base of the post. So you can see we've shown it 
uh, in this square right here. In this case, it's one foot six by one foot six. This was actually a crash tested design. And like I said, I believe TextDot has incorporated the same type of design. And so you're gonna leave that blocked out and then backfill it the low strength material. So in our case, we have spec'd out flowable fill. Backfill that in there, uh, just so there's a nice, again, flush even surface that's aesthetic and, and avoids uh, grass growing through there and things like that. But then when a vehicle, if a vehicle did impact this guardrail, it would be free to then rotate in the soil uh, as it was intended and as it was crash tested to absorb that energy of the impact. And then this frangible material is supposed to crumble and get out of the way. And that's how it was crash tested. And it's important to have the guardrail be able to absorb that energy upon impact. So anytime you have your posts running through a stretch of concrete, you would call out the begin and end station where you expect that these type of posts would be required, these frangible leave outs. And again, call out these post locations where you can predict uh, that you're going to need them in the plans. We'll show you a little bit more about how to do that in the IDS. All right, this is sheet number 22. This is our last index sheet. This one is showing our barrier delineators, uh, the reduced post spacing details, and the bolt system. So really these are just the miscellaneous details to kind of round out the index. They needed a home, so we just compiled them all in the very last sheet. And just to give you guys some details, we explained where the barrier delineators are going to go relative to post 1, post 2, post 3, and then the spacing and the number of spaces for each one of those throughout the run. So this is a significant clarification from the previous standard. It's a little easier to follow uh, which way the direction of traffic is going and things like that. Uh, we also have the, the post bolt details as well as the rectangular washers. Uh, we went ahead and detailed those out for contractors as well, as well as some, some information on exactly where they're supposed to use these things. And then we also have some details showing the reduced uh, post spacing for hazards. And we'll get into that on the next slide. So for the case of reduced post spacing for hazards, what we'd expect from the designer and the plans would be to call out where either your begin end of your half spacing would be or your beginner end of your quarter spacing would be. And this goes back to the PPM table 4.4.2 where what happens is you have a hazard that might be located uh, behind the back of a post and so you have this setback distance. And so when it's outside of five feet from the face of a hazard you really are considered to be in the clear. Uh, the post upon impact will rotate back towards the hazard, but five feet is considered a safer distance and allows the space for this post to rotate. When you start to move inside of five feet and your hazard is very close to the back of that guardrail, you may have to start reducing your post spacing to make the guardrail more rigid. It will rotate a little less upon impact because it has extra posts in there for support. And so that's the idea behind this table. So your typical deflection that you have to design for, or your setback, I should say, that you have to design for is five feet, and that would be at your normal six foot three inch spacing. If you have a hazard uh, that's a little bit closer than five feet from the face of guardrail as is shown, you then reduce the post spacing. So if you had half spacing, the hazard can get as close as three foot 10 inches. If you had quarter spacing, the hazard can get as close as three foot two inches. And so that's the idea behind this. Now, understanding that background, the standard is attempting to make this a little simpler for designers. So if you call out, you need uh, to begin your quarter spacing at this station, you need to end it at that station, the standard will then automatically transition the guardrail. So you have incrementally growing spaces. And so that would be a quarter, basically your quarter space, and that would be a half space, and then that would be a full space. And so you'd want to call that out and then have that show up in the tables. Now, the standard also extends. So if you call out a begin or end of quarter space, the standard will automatically extend that to the nearest post in either direction, basically outside of your range uh, that you've called for. So it automatically handles that. And like I said, it handles the space transition. If you also happen to have low speed guardrail, 12 foot six spacing, then the standard also explains for the contractor that you'd have to have essentially the sequence of your 12 foot 6 space, 6 foot 3 space, 3 foot 1 and a half space, and then your quarter space. And so that would slowly, you know, incrementally change the guardrail rigidity, the guardrail stiffness. We don't want an instantaneous change in stiffness. If we had 12 foot 6 inch space and then we went directly into quarter spacing, the change in rigidity would be too much and you'd likely have a lot of vehicle pocketing 
and snagging, and that essentially means there would be a large amount of deflection here. When you got to the small deflection segment, uh, the vehicle could get caught or hung up on that extra stiffness there and rotate around and it wouldn't perform the way it was crash tested. So you have to incrementally change the rigidity and that's the idea behind this standard. So with that, we say we've reached the end of the game, the end of the fourth quarter, as far as our review of the, the sheets in the index. And so we'll move on and I'll ask you some of the questions. I'll just pause briefly between the questions, give you a few seconds to answer, and then I'll give you the answer. So the number one, what station and offset callouts are required to define a guardrail crossover for median configuration? So if you recall, we said we needed basically two pairs of, of callouts to define the entire guardrail crossover. Yeah, it's the begin end of guardrail and the begin end of taper. And um, our length of need program will provide those outputs for you. And uh, we'll explain that in the upcoming segments. When is rub rail required? So that's for double face guardrail on the median side if the slope is greater than 1 to 10. When is pipe rail required? That's when you have steel posts uh, supporting guardrail and they're within 4 feet of a sidewalk or shared use path. So concerning pipe rail, the roadway plan should assume steel posts are used. True or false? The answer is true. We, we wanted to give the contractor the option of using timber or steel, and for that reason we're going to go ahead and quantify the pipe rail uh, so they, they know that they can account for that if they have to. How many options does a contractor have when a post has an edge conflict with a structure? In this case, we're talking about an in-ground structure, such as a curb inlet or something like that. So the answer is two. It could be a standard post, uh, either mounted in soil or the base plate option. So you, you're allowed to move the post uh, plus or minus a quarter span. And then there's also language in the design standard that allows the contractor to basically field punch that bolt hole for that particular location. They do have to put some, some field uh, galvanization on it cold galvanizing. That's why we don't want this option to use that often. Typically the posts uh, should use uh, the, the, the bolt holes that are prefabricated. But in this case, they can move the post plus or minus a quarter span. When is a frangible leave out used? Okay, when posts fall atop of a sidewalk or a concrete slab. And so obviously the idea is to block out, put some frangible material around it, allows the post to rotate upon impact so the, the guardrail can absorb that energy of the impact and it performs correctly. Question number seven, when is a reduced post spacing segment used? For hazard setbacks uh, less than five feet behind the face of guardrail. So you want to you reduce the offset requirement by stiffening up the guardrail and you're basically reducing the post spacing and then the standard will handle the transition and post space for you. Okay with that we finish the end of our standard index segment. Module 3 would be the continuation of this training where we're going to go ahead and get into the instructions for design standards. So please go ahead and open module 3 to continue the training. Thank you.